I want to uh, welcome everyone uh, to the ASAO Journal CTSNet uh, webinar. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, emerging technology for implantable durable LVADs. Uh, we have an outstanding uh, panel of uh, uh, experts. Uh, there are clearly content experts in this area. Uh, we're looking towards a, a great meeting. Uh, Dr. Uh, Adam uh, Protos, uh, uh, Chief of Adult Cardiac Surgery at Univers University of Mississippi, uh, is our uh, moderator. Uh, and uh, his uh, partner, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashok Kumar from the University of Mississippi, uh, will be our uh, digital uh, uh, moderator. Uh, so we want to welcome everybody, and I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, we hope this will be an interactive uh, session. Uh, certainly put questions in the uh, chat room. Uh, and I want to remind everybody uh, that the ASAO uh, meeting in Chicago uh, currently is uh, still on, uh, should be a, a great uh, venue uh, and hopefully uh, 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 learn about new technology. And I also want to once again, uh, thank and recognize CTSNet uh, and the uh, STS, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, who jointly uh, support uh, these webinars uh, for which we've had a great turnout. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate uh, their support uh, for these efforts. Uh, uh, Dr. Protos, I'll turn it over to you and thank you all very much. Great, thanks Dr. Slaughter. Um, as Dr. Slaughter alluded to, we're really excited about uh, today's webinar. Um, we have some great panelists and hopefully some interactive and thought provoking discussion. I'll just uh, kind of introduce them all and then we can get going. Um, first up for the presentations will be Dr. Amy Fiedler. Um, she's an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she is focused on heart transplantation and MCS and is quickly becoming a young leader in the field. Um, her other initiatives include um, human rights advocacy and uh, global surgery, and she intersperses her busy clinical practice um, with uh, advocacy and medical mission work. Um, welcome, Dr. Fiedler. Uh, the next person on our panel is Dr. Ashish Shaw. Uh, he's a professor and uh, chair of the heart surgery division at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He's an internationally recognized uh, expert in um, heart and lung transplantation and has served at the national level on many societies and transplant organizations. And in 2020, uh, had the distinction of leading Vanderbilt University to one of the busiest heart transplant uh, programs in the world. Uh, welcome, Dr. Shaw. And um, next is uh, Dr. Uh, Mani Danishman. Um, he is an associate professor of surgery uh, in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Emory University in Atlanta, uh, where he is also the director of heart and lung transplantation, mechanical circulatory support, and ECMO there. Uh, he is internationally known for his work uh, of instituting novel approaches for uh, end stage surgical heart failure. And uh, welcome, Dr. Danishman. So, with that, um, we'll jump right in with an intro poll. Um, if we wanna put that up in the audience, please participate. Um, the first question is, how many LVADs are done at your institution? One to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, uh, and more than 30 for the last poll. And this will kind of give us an idea of where folks are coming from. And I believe everybody has a minute to respond. Um, in the meantime, um, so we've already done the welcome and introduction. Uh, Dr. Fiedler's talk um, will focus on new devices in the pipeline, as well as uh, the recent HVAD withdrawal from the market. Um, next, Dr. Shaw will talk about uh, current indications and trends for LVADs as a bridge to transplantation. And um, Dr. Danishman will discuss uh, right ventricular management in the cur current landscape with HeartMate 6 and the total artificial heart. Um, so there are poll results for the first um, poll. You can see that the majority of um, people come from institutions doing less than uh, 10 LVADs a year. Um, and while we're looking at that, why don't we put up the second poll? Um, that uh, will be a segue into uh, Dr. Fiedler's talk here. Uh, 
a good mix, actually. We have uh, people from some kind of bargaining centers and people from some higher volume centers as well. The next poll, uh, how many, oh, no. No, we just did that one. <laughs> Sorry, we'll load up the second one here. True or false, all LVAD patients at my institution are selected and managed using a multidisciplinary heart team approach. Um, and I'll be interested to, to hear what the panelists are doing at their respective um, institutions and, and higher volume centers. Um, and with that, while the panelists or the polls are getting done, uh, Dr. Fiedler, why don't you um, key up your slides and we'll get going. Thanks, Dr. Protos. If you can stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. Interesting. So mostly a hard team approach. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. That yes, looks good, Amy. All right, perfect. Uh, well, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate the invitation to speak to such a large audience on behalf of CTSNet. Um, Dr. Slaughter, Dr. Protos, and the panelists, it's my pleasure to be here. I've been asked to talk about the HVAD withdrawal from the marketplace and new LVAD technologies. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. So as many of us know, it seems like from the first couple of polls, most of us are at centers that are implanting LVADs. And at first there were two. So we had the opportunity to implant either the HeartMate 3, which you see on the left side of the screen, or the HVAD. And for a variety of different reasons, surgeons, heart failure doctors, et cetera, may have a personal preference between either of these pumps. But now we only have one because of the HVAD withdrawal from the market in June of 2021. So the HeartMate 3 currently has the monopoly on the marketplace for implantable durable LVAD. Um, and that's kind of a blessing and a curse for us. And I'd like to take a few moments to discuss the withdrawal of HVAD from the marketplace, what that means from, for us from both the surgical and a medical perspective perspective and new technologies and how we move forward. So the HVAD was withdrawn from the market on June 3rd of 2021. This kind of came as a shock to many of us as it was a class one FDA recall, which is the most serious and significant recalls that the FDA institutes. The recall was a result of increased neurological adverse events and mortality when looking at the HVAD implants as compared to the HeartMate 3 device. Pump stoppage may delay restart, leading to catastrophic events in our patients. And effectively, at, with the advent of this recall, 4,620 devices were recalled just in the United States alone. And as many of our audience um, are from international centers, the HVAD has been a very popular pump in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, so this, this recall has really impacted quite a few patients. Now with the withdrawal of HVAD from the market, Medtronic, the company has, uh, said that they will continue to provide patient support. However, um, I have seen, and I'm sure many of our panelists and folks on this webinar have seen significant patient anxiety surrounding living with a recalled pump. And there have been many, many questions surrounding next steps and how patients should move forward with living with an HVAD. I think one which is most important is if a prophylactic pump exchange from an HVAD to a HeartMate 3 would be indicated for these patients. Now the surgical implications of that regarding the surgical safety of pump exchange to HeartMate 3 were really quickly explored by Dr. Cogswell from the University of Minnesota and a team of multi-institutional collaborators uh, where they looked at an Intermax analysis using the STS database of HVAD to HeartMate 3 pump exchange. This was a very timely paper published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery shortly after the HVAD was withdrawn from the market in order to help us guide surgical and medical decisions making as to what we should do um, with fo for folks who are living with the HVAD if they're feeling significant anxiety and wanting a pump exchange. To make a long story short, the HVAD to H HeartMate 3 exchange was associated with reduced survival compared to remaining on the HVAD without any complications of the HVAD. And they, the investigators determined that there has been insufficient evidence to support elective exchange, uh, meaning that we shouldn't just prophylactically change out these pumps simply because patients are anxious about living with a recalled pump unless there is a clear indication to perform a pump exchange. 
Now there's not only surgical implications with the withdrawal of this pump from the market, but there's also serious medical implications regarding concerns of ongoing care. There's some provider concerns regarding lack of familiarity amongst the care team with the HVAD pump removal from the market, meaning that some newer clinicians may be unfamiliar with the HVAD, how to manage the pump, not only from a cardiology and a surgical standpoint, but also ICU nurses and et cetera, and how these patients can continue to live and interact in society. As a result of this, there is a consensus document which is now in press regarding the optimal care for HVAD patients moving forward, which really focuses on medical management, anticoagulation protocols, and how to best manage that pump in the setting of no one being implanted with that pump from June 2021 onward. So the question remains now what? We have one pump that we're able to implant, which is a very good pump, the HeartMate 3. HVAD is off the market, but now what? There's some advancements that are important and have been thought about for a long period of time in terms of providing optimal care and improving the engineering and um, technology and innovation with respect to LVAB. A major aspect of these pumps that is limiting to patients is the driveline. So no driveline, making uh, LVAD pumps completely wireless, no driveline, so no driveline infections and no tethering. Again, being wireless and being able to charge the batteries either through the skin or from a wireless um, access point. Improved hemocompatibility and improved physiologic performance is important and there's some uh, necessary innovations with respect to the engineering of these pumps to do that. The ability for a patient to be free and disconnected, not only from the driveline, but also from the battery pack. Now there's a few different emerging technologies that I think are worthwhile to touch upon. And again, this is really just a starting point for further discussion uh, amongst ourselves and the panelists today on this webinar. I think the most promising, which has been talked about for a number of years now is the Abbott fully implantable left ventricular assist system. I'm sure many of the, all of the panelists and many of the, in, the uh, participants in this webinar have seen pictures and schematics of this device. Um, but it's, it's a fully implantable LVAD with no external components. So no drive line. The patient can be untethered for four to six hours at a time, leading to really improved quality of life. And even uh, most interesting to me is the ability to charge the battery pack um, through the skin, which limits the need for carrying around clunky um, chargers and multiple batteries. The Everhart LVAD is another emerging technology, which is currently um, with an ongoing human trial called the Competence Trial, which my center is enrolled in. The pump is a hydraulically suspended impeller system, which promotes pulsatility and therefore uh, is potentially more physiologic. And physiologic responsiveness is very important for patients who are living with continuous flow devices. So this may be uh, a device that can help patients uh, who need that physiologic responsive nature. The competence trial is ongoing and results should be coming out soon. And I found this pump interesting, the core wave LVAD, which is only in preclinical studies, but the technology is patented out of a company in France, uh, which they call this disruptive wave membrane technology, which has been de designed um, effectively through marine animals, which is quite interesting, which is uh, it allows for mimicking of the native heart for pulsatile flow. Again, really harping upon the need for improved hemocompatibility as well as bioresponsiveness uh, for patients to have a better quality of life when they're living with a durable LVAM. Like I said, this pump is in preclinical studies, so we're a number of years away from this um, being uh, you know, at the forefront of LVAD technology, but I think it demonstrates that there's still quite a bit of interest in terms of innovative and disruptive technologies and engineering, specifically within the heart failure space to improve care for our patients. So in conclusion, HeartMate 3 currently monopolizes our market. There's needed technological advances in order to improve care for our patients. Providers are going to need to continue to have ongoing care for patients with HVAD pumps. They're not going away. So we're going to have to continue to make sure that people are up to date and familiar uh, with the HVAD pump and for our patients living with the HVAD pump. And pump exchange will be necessary in certain situations. Surgical expertise is required as this is not exactly a straightforward surgical procedure. But based on the evidence that we have now, prophylactic pump exchange from a HeartMate 3, or I'm sorry, from an HVAD to a HeartMate 3 uh, is not indicated. Uh, so thank you for having me today. I'd welcome uh, any questions.
think you're muted. Thought I unmuted myself. Um, Sorry, I was just saying, well, thank you, Dr. Fiedler. That was great. Uh, I know that it's a salient issue for a lot of us that um, come from active LVAD centers as we have quite a few patients that have had uh, the HVAD in, in recent times. Um, and I, I would just like to open it with a question about how you guys are doing it um, there at your program and your thoughts on um, supporting these patients um, from, not just the patients themselves, but also your team, so that you, there's continued um, clinical kind of competency among your team members, especially as you bring on new team members with devices that you know are, are now removed from the market that there are not going to be any more implants for. Um, and um, and then also to kind of dovetail off that, um, what is your threshold in your practice been for exchanging um, these HVADs? I know there really has not been a consensus document. Um, to, to guide us yet? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Those are really great questions. Uh, for your first question in terms of how we're continuing to educate our providers and, and keep current with our patients, uh, Medtronic has still committed a rep, specifically an HVAD rep, to our institution as we were a pretty reasonably sized HVAD center prior to the pump coming off the market. Uh, the rep has been critical in order to continue to educate our patients as well as our new nursing staff, um, et cetera, to be sure that everyone understands how to manage the pump, um, not only for the patients when they're at home, but also for the patients when they get admitted to our center. As, as you know, we're all at big academic centers. There can be quite a bit of nursing turnover, new staff, and, and things like that. So um, our rep has been critical. I think this consensus document that should be coming out in JTCVS will also be very important uh, because it's very detailed. It, uh, it allows us to understand not only how the pump is functioning, functioning, but also how we should continue to manage the patients um, down to the blood pressure management, anticoagulation, et cetera, which I think is going to be really important. Uh, your second question in terms of when we do a pump exchange. So we're not prophylactically exchanging HVAD to HeartMate 3. For us, the only indication to do the pump exchange would be, is it would be if we have an issue with the pump. So pump thrombosis, um, drive line shortage, things like that, things that would really cause us in any situation to do a pump exchange. We have had a number of patients come to us and say that they were quite anxious living with an HVAD as a recalled device, uh, but we counsel them through that as we don't want to put them through the surgical risk of going HVAD to HeartMate 3 if it's not necessary. I would be interested though to hear what the other panelists' practice has been now that HVAD has been pulled from the market and how they're managing these patients as well. Yeah, and uh, I think that's something we'll definitely broach during the panel discussion because we're having a you know significant amount of anxiety is coming from the patients themselves um, as they're hearing articles in the lay press and nervous about support. Um, but I would like to touch on a question from the audience that I think is uh, pretty salient. Uh, Sarah Sch uh, Schroeder has asked, uh, as an NP coordinator in our program, it is not necessarily the failure of the pump itself but it's a failure of the external components uh, that we deal with, sometimes multiple times a month. Um, this would be the only concern that I have. By everything going on in the inside, how do we manage internal equipment failures, surgery or percutaneous um, uh, procedures? And she wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's a really good question. Uh, I think you know, I think everyone's experiencing a, a similar thing if they see a lot of HVADs in, in their center. If this is happening time and time again, unfortunately, I think this is an indication for a pump exchange, and that's how we've been managing these patients. It's very difficult, especially with the pump off the market now, uh, to continue to reliably get the necessary equipment that we had easy access to when the pump was being produced and there was quite a bit of support for it uh, to manage these things. But now I think if we're having multiple issues in a, in a month over the course of a number of months, I would favor a pump exchange for a patient like that. Um, okay, well, that, uh, you know, I, I think that um, that's good advice, especially as we're all trying to deal with this. And, and while we're talking a little bit more, I would uh, ask Chris to throw up our next poll so the audience can be taking that. Um, but we got another um, great audience question, Amy, um, that is asking what you think the, uh, what do you think about the Abbott monopoly um, in terms of how it will affect their rollout of the fully implantable device. 
And uh, before you answer, I just want to encourage the audience to participate in our third poll. Um, what is the preferred primary implantation approach for the first time LVAD placement at your institution? And um, go ahead, Amy. Another excellent question. I don't think mon a monopoly is ever the answer, right? The competition drives innovation. I think having two pumps on the market, two uh, what appeared to be very good and durable implantable pumps um, drove innovation. As Medtronic said that they were also working on a fully implantable device simultaneously and in parallel with Abbott. I'm hopeful that the Abbott engineering team is dedicated enough to the heart failure population, which I think that they are, that they'll continue to move forward with the fully implantable device. And I'm hoping that the withdrawal of HVAD from the market will not delay the rollout of that any, um, but, but I, I personally don't think a monopoly is the way to go. And I wish that we still had another pump to drive innovation and competition in this space. Okay. Great. Hey, Adam, can I, can I just make two comments? One, yeah, one is that, um, you know, first of all, this isn't a new phenomenon. That is to have devices that have been kind of retired or not in use, and for all of the teams to have to adapt to it. I mean, you know, Mark knows uh, very well, and Monty, that you know there are people with uh, PVAD pumps floating around that you had to have some competency because they would show up in your center and need transplant or something like that. So I think that's something the field will always have to understand. That there's gonna be levels of, of just maintaining some core competencies in managing these. And, and maybe the companies need to be that source because the, they'll eventually disappear, but there'll always be these sort of transition in, in gaps. And the other comment I had is that, you know, I, I agree with Amy that the, the monopoly in the VAD space is a bad thing in general. Um, but I think in some respects, it's actually a call, really, um, it's a call to leadership on the part of all really uh, academic teams and basic science teams and engineering teams to actually solve some of these problems, because it's not, it can't all be on the, um, you know, at the feet of the companies to solve all these things. I think they're going to need, you know, our help to innovate and, and solve that. And that's, again, another just historically, that's been the sweet spot is that, you, you know, the big ideas are going to come from, you know, all of us and all the people in the audience and, um, and then the companies partner with us to, to take it to the take it to the next level. So I think it's also going to be really interesting to see how this intersection of small developers and large players in the VAD market really evolves and materializes and how that technology is incorporated and brought to market. Yeah. So, and one last be, question to Amy was uh, uh, from the audience is like, uh, what is the surgical techniques or difficulties that you face for a pump exchange? Is it like a routine one or is there any tips and pitfalls for the pump exchange when you go for like more and more HVAD, like approximately around 4,000 patients of HVAD patients are right now having this anxiety and what are your tricks at the sleeve for the pump exchange? Oh, yeah, it's not, it, it, it's not necessarily a straightforward operation. I think that's something that we can probably talk about in the panel discussion amongst all three of us. Um, but there are certain things with respect to fitting the pump into the new sewing ring, what you're going to do about how you're going to manage the sewing ring, how you're going to manage the outflow graft, etc. So um, I think that's a bit of a longer conversation. I don't want to get us hung up here before we move forward with the next presentation. But that's a, um, that's a great question for the panel discussion a little bit later on. Thank you for keeping Agreed. us on time. I can tell you've done a couple webinars before, Amy. So with that, let us move to uh, Dr. Ashish Shaw and his portion of the talk. And interestingly, that our poll, um, and, and it would be, um, um, we can talk about uh, different approach, uh, what different approaches, the different technical concerns that they create, but, um, you know, full 70% of people in this uh, webinar are still implanting VADs by a full sternotomy. So uh, with that, Dr. Shaw, do you want to? Yes. You wish. All right. What do you guys see? Did I do the share screen thing properly, or are we good? Enlarge the screen, I guess. Yeah. I, think there's some, I think we're looking at your note slide. Uh, How's that? There you yeah, go. That's better. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, I was charged to talking about um, uh, LVAD as a bridge to transplant. I think what I'm, I'm going to take advantage of it and really talk about how um, really, policy changes can have a dramatic impact on, on our clinical practice and, and take a little snapshot of what happened when the allocation system in the United States changed 
and and what it did to to most centers, both nationally. And I'll tell you a little bit what happened to us in Vanderbilt. And then I think give a little glimpse of what the future will look like, um, at least from from my uh, my perspective here. So in some respects, I think that this uh, almost um, you know uh, uh, significant and kind of shattering change of our practice when we think about bridge to transplant LVAD forces us to go back to our original premise about why we even put in LVADs to begin with. So, you know, the LVAD as a bridge to transplant really was predominantly to recondition patients, but there had been experience of doing very high urgency heart transplants in people that were very sick or on ECMO or in ICUs, and they didn't do that well. And when considering a scarce resource, this idea of a mechanical solution to help liberate the patient from the intensive care unit, go home, recondition their, um, uh, their kidneys and their, uh, their overall physical status was why this was really designed. And it, and it works very well in the majority of patients who do that. There's also a couple other items that we we think about. One was that we use these LVADs as a way to assess the patient's, you know, uh, uh, ability to be compliant with a complex medical regimen. It allow them to to get off uh, tobacco and alcohol or, or or drug use, and and comply with whatever the standards are for the for the program. Again, so that they can be a good stewards for the more scarce resource of of a heart transplant. And then the final, at least in my mind, reason that we did this is so that we could make the post-transplant outcomes better. So that's where we think about using uh, LVADs as a bridge to transplant. And when we look at how we allocated hearts prior to the 2018 change, for the most part, we had the 1A, 1B, and 2 status system. And then you skipped over to 7, which was um, patients who are inactivated, but you know, in the system. And then the 1A patients were generally people on inotropes, sitting in ICUs, and importantly, were a group of left ventricular cyst device placed, placed patients that had what we call their 30A time or 30 day time. And so they were given by virtue of having an LVAD when they were stable, time um, to get higher priority. And it, for the most part, worked where those patients would get um, hearts. Uh, at a priority to other folks. And, you know, as the LVAD technology improved and really as our ability to take care of these patients got better and our patient selection improved, the general feeling was that, well, these LVAD patients don't need this time anymore because their wait list mortality was, was declining, that that urgency wasn't there unless they developed some complication of the device. And so this seems to be part of some of the calculus when the new system was designed. And then you see the new status fleshed out these statuses. So now between one and seven, there's all sorts of new stratification. And I draw your attention to the first two that I think are the most important, status one and status two. So patients on ECMO, a non-dischargeable VAD, um, life-threatening arrhythmias, and as you can see, balloon pumps, the percutaneous left ventricular cyst devices, and then obviously mechanical support, uh, mechanical devices with that with mechanical failure. But you see that patient that we used to think about as an LVAD bridge to transplant, the stable person at home reconditioned within a well-functioning LVAD that would get their 30 days of 1A time. Well, they wind up somewhere in the uh, class four or priority four area. And so that all seems reasonable until you, one realizes that these higher priority patients, not only do they get access to hearts locally, they start getting access to hearts in other um, organ recovery areas further and further out from the primary center. So there's an obvious, and I think most of us felt like there was an intense advantage to having patients on ECMO, for example, or with a balloon pump or an impella and go straight to transplant, why bother if you can get a heart? And, and we're pretty good in the ICU, so we'll be able to take care of these patients afterwards. All that, all that old days of, of 
urgent heart transplant, well, that's those guys didn't know how to take care of anybody. Now we, we can do this and we're better at it. So this policy change leads to very drastic behavioral changes on the part of US transplant and LVAD centers. And uh, as documented in, in the STS Intermax annual report, you see this, you know, at least this concept of bridge to transplant, destination therapy, or bridge to decision um, get completely upended in a very short period of time where the percentage of patients that were being bridged to transplant, that is their LVAD was being placed with the intention of getting to transplantation or be considered for transplant rapidly declines. As you can see there in 2019, only 8.9% were being considered for transplantation upfront and 18 as sort of a bridge to candidacy. So in many respects, because of the change of that system, the priority given to patients um, with balloon pumps, impellas, on ECMO, and then the sense from transplant centers that why don't we just do that and get them a heart, it really upends our conventional notions of listing and practice. And it wasn't just big academic medical centers. It really has been carried out throughout the country. And I can tell you from our cardiology colleagues, many of them look at that system and the way it's been in practice and say, I feel like if I put an LVAD in my patient, they will be disadvantaged. It would almost doom them to never getting a transplant. And I think that sentiment um, I think it actually persists uh, even to this day. And it's gonna be one of the things that we need to think about uh, in the future, particularly when we think about innovating in devices that, that you're up against really, you know, uh, we're back up against that gold standard in a sense of biventricular, no drive line, the power source is internalized. Well, that's what a heart transplant is, right? All those things that Dr. Friedler pointed out is what a heart transplant ends up being. And, and, in, and when you see the, and, and of course, when they institute this policy, no, well, they're not gonna do that. There's no way they would do that. That's crazy. Why would you all of a sudden start using balloon pumps and ECMO when we've got these great LVADs that work? And that's not how humans behaved. And you can see a really terrifically interesting study um, out of Boston that showed that the dramatic increase in um, both impella use and intraortic balloon pump usage, all as a result of, of this policy change. And, and I think you know, we can all imagine that um, there is intense incentive and advantage to many patients to get a heart transplant yeah. directly. So what, how, did, how else did this trend, how did also this policy change change how uh, we transplanted? Well, the, the goal of this policy change was of course to lower weightless mortality. And then there's no question that that's, that's, that is what happened. There was no real notion about what would have happened afterwards or um, sort of in, in play. So nice paper from Armand Kilic uh, that initially looked at what happens um, in the United States when you change the priority and you give advantage to patients uh, that are on impellas or ECMO or balloon pumps and deprioritize the LVAD patient. And you can see that status two level person in, a, in an ICU on a balloon pump, for example, not an LVAD patient, not the conventional, I'm at home with an LVAD. Uh, they, are, they dominate the transplants that are done in the United States. That group of four, that priority four score, uh, much lower. Now, there, it's no secret that our enthusiasm at Vanderbilt for LVADs kind of pivoted um, several years ago. And we um, really put more of an emphasis on heart transplantation. This is actually, I just got the slide uh, today, actually. And this looks at what our, at Vanderbilt's listing status is over the last several months, um, month to month. And you can see, you know, again, there, there is a mixed bag. It isn't all just status ones and status twos, but there's still certainly, you know, month to month, a good percentage of patients. Um, nonetheless, even in our program, we still have people who get listed as, as status four. And, and who gets transplanted? You know, we actually have been able to transplant 
those status four, uh, priority four patients, um, not having a, a huge need for a lot of those status twos. Um, and that's really driven by very aggressive uh, donor recovery strategies on our end. In our program, we do believe since we can get hearts for people, at least for now, um, that the bridge to transplant LVAB really kind of boils down to patients that are bridge to decision, truly sorting things for compliance issues. Um, and then um, the other smaller but growing group of patients with adult congenital heart disease. Um, and that's a physiology that is also a webinar in and of itself to try to understand uh, the utility of, of these devices. But I think that that's, that's where that, that can land. Now, what are the consequences of this? Now, we didn't account for this in this priority scheme, that what happens afterwards. And one of the this fascinating paper, again, from Greg Cooper's, Greg Cooper's group in Boston, that looks at, you know, we conventionally think if you get a bridge to transplant LVAD, your post heart transplant outcomes are good because we know how to do the operation, we know how to manage the patients, we know how to um, uh, do our patient selection. Well, it does look like in the newer system, that bridge to transplant LVAD patient now has, there's a signal there that our outcomes are even worse. And you can, you can imagine and speculate what that's all about. You know, you're now selecting out for patients that, that may be really having dysfunctional LVADs and the, not, and the folks who are very stable are just home on their LVAD. But this is a signal that's not good. And that one that we have to be very mindful of and maybe an unintended consequence again of, of this system. So is this the end of bridge to transplant LVAD? Well, if we avoid LVAD as a bridge to transplant, it's certainly cheaper. The patients like it, right? The, the prospects of undergoing an LVAD, terrifying, and then undergoing heart transplant, terrifying, um, seems to be, you know, not as appealing to the patient as let's just, you know, get a heart transplant. And we see that story and all of you see that story every day. When can we just get a heart? That's what I really want. But ultimately, you know, who benefits from this? Are, are we really benefiting the patient? Are we benefiting the system? We still have a scarce resource. Um, and I think we haven't answered that question. This is a, um, the Columbia team uh, put out a paper prior to the allocation scheme changing on ECMO as a bridge to heart transplant. It's a great paper, but the best part is actually Stefan Schuler's comment. And I was there in the audience. This is why as you get older, you don't really read the papers anymore. You just read the discussions because they're far more entertaining. Um, and, and, and those of you know Professor Scholler know this is not that an uncommon a, a statement from him, but I love this because he says, um, I think for the future, it is completely unacceptable to transplant patients from ECMO because of these results. You are wasting organs. You have perfect patients on your wait list on LVADs who have normal kidney function, no problems at all. And in the present era with very good mechanical support, there's no justification, not a single one, not even in the congenital group where we documented the LVAD therapy works uh, to do all this. And then he, he ends with a very good paper and a walk and, you know, mic drops and he walks off. But I think he, you know, there's some truth uh, to this notion that, you know, is this a good use uh, of, the, of the scarce research that's heart transplant? So in conclusion, despite these early trends, and we sort of saw some of this when the allocation system for lung changed. There was this sort of enthusiasm for ECMO bridging, and initially our results weren't that great. And the system really did, and, and all the you know, professional people that are involved in this, I think found their way back to, to getting things right. So the outcomes now, if you bridge someone with lung transplant with ECMO, are much better now than they were at the, at the um, initiation of that change in the lung transplant system. But again, to Dr. Fiedler's point, I think we have, what we need innovation is to make the LVAD technology better and to really start thinking about power problems, drive lines. The one issue that we didn't talk about is that LVADs force patients into univentricular physiology. We convert everybody to Fontan. Well, you know, there's a lot of patients out there floating around with just this sort of RV problems, not the things we deal with in the operating room, but in clinics and the nurse practitioners and the care coordinators that are on this webinar know there's, there's 
you know, this sort of corrosive problem of RVs that aren't so great. So how do we create biventricular solutions? And, and I think uh, that is back on us to figure out ways to have two pumps talk to each other, a really good total artificial heart. Um, these are things that are on us. But I do think there is growth in the adult and general world. We're seeing more and more of these patients. They're complicated. Their physiology is a little mysterious and their modes of heart failure are different. Is there a role for um, mechanical support? I think so. And while our current emphasis is on survival it's after transplant, I think the next phase of this from a policy standpoint is gonna be on functional outcomes and quality of life. And I think there, we're gonna see a return to using LVADs to bridge patients because I think they will do better after transplant have a higher quality of life. That paper that Dr. Professor Schuler was commenting on, the biggest conclusion of that paper was that at one year, those patients transplanted off of ECMO had really bad functional outcomes. They're, they're alive, but even the survivors didn't feel well, weren't living independently. This is gonna be our challenge. And I think this is an opportunity for the medical, uh, mechanical support world to get bridge transplant right. And then Zeno, and this is not the subject of this um, talk, but I, I think obviously with um, you know the extraordinary case by Bart Griffith's team at University of Maryland, I, I think you got to ask yourself a question that if Zeno becomes a thing and organ scarcity is not a thing anymore, where does that put bridging strategies? And I think we go back to the original premise of how do you get better post-transplant outcomes? And that's where uh, LVADs still, I think, have an important role, particularly if we overcome some of the device limitations that we've already highlighted. So, um, you know, will we see this in the future? I think we still will. Um, this is actually a uh, good old fashioned HeartMate 2, of all things, uh, placed by my old partner, John Conti, in a minimally invasive fashion, believe it or not. Um, you know, so ultimately, I, I think that there will be a role. I think we have some innovation. But I, but I think this policy change has two major conclusions. One is that these policy changes have, can have major impacts on how we take care of patients and they should be approached very thoughtfully. And that number two, I think we do need to start shifting to post-transplant outcomes, not just survival, but functional outcomes and heart transplant to really assess the utility of how we allocate organs. So um, I don't know if it's entirely what you're driving at and asking me to talk about uh, uh, Adam and Mark, but I appreciate the opportunity to bring this up and, and the discussion we can have around this. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dr. Shaw, for that. That was uh, really thought provoking. I just, you know, as you were going through your slides, um, a question that popped up in, in my mind and you touched on it briefly is, um, as more centers are embracing DCD strategies um, and more tools, um, I'm, I'm assuming you are um, um, kind of thinking that it's going to further diminish the incentive as the donor pool gets bigger to commit people to bridge to transplant LVAD therapy. Um, is, that a, is that a trend you see continuing as how do you think it will be impacted by embrace, widening embrace of DCD hearts? That's a, another webinar entirely. <laughs> so I, my short answer is, I think the DCD story um, is in evolution. I think that the total change in the donor pool will be a little bit flat, to be honest. There's some weird trends of you know, donors that would have otherwise been considered um, brain dead, but nobody wants to wait, so they get converted to DCD. That, and then the growth of other programs, you know, the reluctance on, on the part of programs and OPOs to embrace DCD and then um, some other things that I think ultimately it'll, it'll still be a little on the flat side. I, I, think, you, I think you're going to see, you know, I will say conservatively that we'll see a bump up in, in total donors by another 15, 20 percent. I think that's hundreds of patients nationally. So that's a big deal. I don't think that serves the really large number of patients that are out there with heart failure. I'm not just suggesting that the, the million number that always comes up in people's talks, but it's still surely more than 3,500 or 3,600 or even 4,000. So I, I think the, you know, the incentives are the incentives as they are now. I think right now, 
people are still going to put someone in the IC, put a balloon pump in and, and get a nice heart for them as fast as they can, however they do that. However, if you're not a center that is going to be able to get those people transplanted within a reasonable amount of time, or have the mechanisms in your intensive care units to prehabilitate them, you're going to have lousy outcomes. And for most programs, you know, if you are doing less than 30 heart transplants a year, you can't afford bad outcomes like that. Right. And it's not a good use of resources. I mean, we can't either. Nobody can because ultimately it's a scarce resource. So I, I think there's going to be a, a right sizing of, of this behavior. It may require us to revisit this allocation scheme and say, you got to take into account post-transplant outcomes. And not just survival. I mean, all of us on this call know that you can drag things out for a long time and have someone who is miserable and sad and not what you intended. So I think those are the things that are that are still in play. So, and uh, and uh, Dr. CJ, let me let you jump in here for just a sec. I know there was an audience question that you wanted to ask, Dr. Shaw. Well, it's more of a, a combined question from my perspective as well. I mean, we have a first allocation in 2006 and the second in 2018, but we have been talking about the prospect to uh, good outcomes for patients on LVAS based on their compliance and, uh, and other stuff. So do you think we had to wait for another 10 more years for the allocation status to change to make this LVAD come back up to the status, or do you think you need to re renegotiate saying well, these patients it's, it's, are like much... No, the, I've seen the enemy. The enemy is us. We're it. We're the field. So I, I think that, you know, if the community, if we all of us as experts say that we need to revise it, we need to revise it and rethink it. But I think you, I think the first thing that we have to do is establish what our goals are. And if we want to, if, if, if our goal is just weightless mortality, they've done it. They've done a good job. That plus, if you add aggressive efforts on the side of donors, it's not just DCD, it's, it's um, education, it's getting um, organ donation uh, at a hospital basis uh, improved, you know, that you'll, you'll get where you, where you want to go. And optimal medical management is pretty good. I mean, we're keeping people alive before transplant. But if our goal is really post-transplant outcome and really getting long-term survivors, I, I think that that's, the, that's really what we need to bring back to not just UNOS, but our peers and say, hey, let's revisit this because now our goal is this. I don't think the people that or I mean, those people that designed the priorities are our friends and our colleagues. I mean, they're people we know. It wasn't a mystery. It was they, they, they had a task and then they, this is the system they came up with and there was public comment and it, and it happened. So, you know. Oh, just if I can make a quick comment about that part of the system also when they designed this, they knew that this was going to be an imperfect system and you know I spend a lot of time talking to Joe Rogers about the you know allocation scheme and you know what they want to you know what we're what Ash is alluding to is essentially a heart allocation score like we have for the lung allocation score where it balances weightless mortality and um, post transplant mortality and maybe be awesome to have some quality of life measures in there too. And I think UNOS is moving towards that, you know, as we see with the, with the new um, MPSC criteria that have come out with regards to conditional survival, as we see. And I think at some point, you know, part of the endeavor of the new al allocation scheme for heart was a mandate to collect data to ultimately in the future have a heart allocation score. So it's on the way. We're just making steps, iterative steps towards it. That's, you know, we're an iPhone six. We, we need to wait for iPhone eight. <laughs> and with that, I think uh, we'll move on to your portion of the uh, talk, Dr. Danishman. Um, if we can throw up our last poll, I think that would be a great segue. And um, there it is, everybody. Um, primary method of temporary RV support following LVAD placement at your institution. Um, I think this is particularly relevant uh, to what Dr. Danishmund is going to be talking to us about. Um, and uh, I think uh, there's a lot more to talk about in the, in the panel discussion at the end. Hopefully we'll have a few minutes because um, we've had a lot of excellent uh, audience questions as well um, regarding the new allocation system and 
obviously, uh, it's like predicting the market, uh, predicting human behavior is always a, a difficult thing to, to quantify. And I think that's a large part of it. Um, now, uh, Dr. Danishman, if you just want to start and then we can talk about the poll results at the end, that'd be great. Cause I know we're kind of inching on to the hour here. Sounds great, and I'll do my best to, to make up some time here. It's a tough act to follow Dr. Fiedler and Dr. Shaw, and so I, I consider it as unfair treatment here, but um, let's keep going. So, you know, I think um, one of the things that's always telling for me, I like to put some searches in PubMed and then uh, take a look at the trends for publications, because it really gets you understanding of, you know, what are the, if, if the thing that you're trying to do is a is really a hot topic or not, and we see that RV failure post LVAD really over the last 10 years has had a huge uptick and an exponential growth with regards to publications around it. And I think that's important. It's a timely topic. It's something we really need to talk about. And, you know, why is that? Well, we know that any level of RV failure after an LVAD or during an LVAD uh, implant has a significant survival disadvantage for the patients. And so we were just talking about potentially bridging patients to transplant or destination therapy. And, you know, with our, with our current modern LVAD techniques and, and tools, um, we're setting up patients for a significant disparity in outcomes, depending on how their right ventricle is doing. That gets even worse if the patients need to have uh, mechanical circuitry support. And regardless of if that mechanical circuitry support has to be done um, in the OR to come off bypass or at some point during their um, <clears throat> post-VAD um, hospital stay, the upfront mortality and long-term mortality is very high for these patients. Um, and so what about those patients who survive the index operation and then develop delayed RV failure? Well, we know that even delayed RV dysfunction will make a significant impact on your likelihood to survive. This is some really nice work done by uh, Will Heisinger's group in Stanford. And um, they did some excellent modeling and <clears throat> competing risks and looked at patients who had or didn't have uh, RV failure after their VAD and looked at, well, what were the competing outcomes? Well, a majority of them who have RV failure die before ever getting a transplant, die with their MCS. The, the likelihood of survival with their mechanical circulatory support, which is represented by the area under the curve here, or over the curve here, is significantly less than without RV failure. So it's a long-term problem for these patients. We also see that their likelihood of getting transplanted and alive after transplant is significantly less. So a vast majority of these people, RV failure um, will, will hurt them. So what's our best um, therapies here? I think you know, as we look at it, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure always, right? And so, you know, we have developed lots of different techniques to try to figure out who are the patients who are going to develop RV failure. And, um, you know, there's lots of different metrics out there. TAPC has been used as one to try to figure out the uh, strength of that right ventricle. Uh, <clears throat> but also things like fractional shortening and other uh, um, echocardiographic uh, measures have been used. Um, really, there's a lot of energy being put into echocardiographic measures now with the advent of 3D technologies and 4D technologies looking at multi-planar um, uh, sections through the RV and trying to determine if there are areas of RV dysfunction that are more likely to cause problems is, is really a hot topic, especially amongst cardiology and cardiac anesthesia groups. And they're doing a lot of good work uh, to try to predict RV failure preoperatively. Probably some of the best um, uh, data still is, is physiologic. You know that Naveen Kapoor's group out of Tufts really uh, described the impact of PAPI. Now, as we're talking about bridging options, you know, we, with, uh, with the advent of the Impella 5.5 and axillary Impella, we're able to even bridge people to a bridge, which would be the, the VAD. And so um, we can look at patients who are supported with axillary impella in an attempt to optimize them for durable VAD. Uh, and there are clear data out there that 
uh, how you respond to having that axillary impella in will it, it will mimic how you respond to having a durable LVAD in there. So if you have a significant drop in your right atrial pressure, if you have a significant drop in your wedge, or if your pappy changes significantly, well, all those things are good signs that you're going to do well with a durable LVAD. And I think that would be an interesting way to stratify patients, you know, those who are responsive with the axillary impella and do have significant improvements, well, maybe those patients long-term would be better served with getting, instead of sitting around and waiting for a transplant, getting their durable LVAD and moving on. And only those patients who don't have the same physiologic response, we could consider a biventricular replacement on, which right now our best option is heart transplant. Finally, even if you leave the hospital, um, your post-discharge RV failure status does impact your long-term survival. So if you have no RV failure, which the vast majority of people who survive three months with an LVAD do, well, you're going to do well. You're going to have you know, a 7% one-year mortality. Your risk of um, rehospitalization is going to be less. Your risk of stroke is going to be less. Your risk of GI bleeding is going to be less. But you know, 10% of patients who get LVADs have a significant amount of RV failure. And that's not a small number uh, of patients. And that RV failure has a large impact on their survival and their quality of life. If we look at rehospitalization and other complications as a proxy of that. And so it goes back to really being able to predict and prevent RV failure. Um, you know, I think when we look at it though, excluding patients from mechanical circuitry support because of the risk of RV failure achieves a goal. The goal that that achieves is it improves LVAD outcomes. But, you know, I guess the question is, is that the right goal we should be pursuing or are there, is there a different goal? It, should our goal actually be um, getting patients with RV failure through their index procedure and getting them better um, with mechanical circuitry support, because there's always going to be a subset of patients who are not eligible for heart transplant for various reasons, have stage four heart failure, and have a high risk of RV failure. What do we do for those patients? How do we uh, address their needs and, and really uh, support them? And that proportion of the population, I would posit, is growing and will continue to grow as we uh, continue to have better uh, therapies for heart failure. And probably, you know, what would come to mind, this was what our ancestors wanted to do. Since the early 1900s, we've, man has been pursuing a better heart, right? Um, the most, you know, the well-known, the most well-known device, of course, is the Syncardia device. And this is really 1960s and 70s technology that was first implanted in the 80s. Uh, and really hasn't changed since then. This is the sa essentially the same device uh, that uh, Barney Clark got, uh, the Jarvik 7. Uh, it's a pneumatically driven pump. It's got membranes and it's got mechanical um, valves and, you know, it, has, it, it can thrombose and it can fail. And it is, it's a unwieldy and, and, and big device to move around and very noisy. And, you know, unfortunately, um, despite a lot of expertise with it, a lot of effort with it, it has a significantly high mortality rate. And, you know, this device is not performing as well as we would want it to. And so, you know, this field is really ripe for a lot of innovation. Okay. And one of the innovators in this area is uh, Professor Carpentier and the team at, um, at Air France. So they decided, you know, Professor Carpentier decided in, in, in only uh, a way that Dr. Carpentier can that, you know what, forget all this getting biomedical engineers and, and doing things the traditional way. Let's go ahead and uh, design something from the ground up and use engineers that have no experience in the area. And so he got some airplane engineers, uh, not Air France, Airbus, excuse me, at Airbus and had them... Uh, <laughs> Uh, design a new pump. And, you know, this pump is actually quite interesting. It's, you know, it uses biological Carpentier Edwards valves and it has, um, it's auto-regulated and it has pretty good hemocompatibility. When you look at the, when you look at the data, the pump has two motors that drive 
that's driven electrically, it's not pneumatically driven, um, and it can auto-regulate blood flow. Uh, the outcomes have been very good in Europe. This is the European data, and you know they implanted 15 patients and with, with relatively good survival, two-year survival uh, of around 60%, six-month survival of 73%, with very low complication rate. They've had no strokes, no GI bleeding, no uh, driveline infections, uh, which has been excellent and, you know, compares favorably um, to the complication rate anyway, to durable LVAD, uh, and significantly better than uh, the other biventricular options that we have available right now. That um, device is currently undergoing a clinical trial in the United States, and, you know, maybe Mark can comment about his experience. He has the U.S. experience on it, having done 66% of the U.S. implants uh, uh, to date. Um, uh, and so it'd be interesting to get some comments on that. Another exciting uh, device in, uh, out there is the Bivacor um, uh, pump. And this is a, a biventricular support pump that is uh, electrically driven. But instead of having valves and membranes, this is a uh, continuous flow pump with one single impairment impeller. The big innovation here is that this impeller is two-sided with different veins on either side. So it creates uh, one set of HQ curves and flow dynamics for the left ventricular replacement portion and one set of HQ curves and flow dynamics for the right ventricular uh, portion. It's got one moving part. It's a uh, frictionless uh, full maglev device, and uh, it seems to be very promising in animal data. Uh, the company Bivacor has uh, got enough funding now for human trials, and hopefully those will be starting soon. So that will also be a very uh, exciting thing to review in the future. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, we don't live in the future. We live in now, and we, you know, as we're trying to figure out things to do while we wait for these new technologies, and I would posit that the HeartMate 6 still represents a relevant and good uh, option for patients with biventricular, who, have, who need biventricular support, who would otherwise not be candidates for transplant uh, and need some durable option or need something to bridge them to transplant. And the way we do it, it's very similar to uh, any other total artificial heart implant. It starts with a ventriculectomy. Um, we like to leave a rim of tissue uh, to provide a little bit of space and rigidity because atrium itself can be very floppy and these pumps are very heavy. And we fashion uh, the inflow uh, connectors to each of these, uh, the left and right ventricles uh, with uh, interrupted sutures, making sure to obliterate the LVOT, the RVOT, the coronary sinus, as well as the left atrial appendage so that there's no repository for thrombus. Um, and then you can put the pumps in and sew the grafts to the PA and aorta, uh, measure them out exactly as uh, with the length that would be necessary. You know, the patient's uh, tolerate that procedure pretty well. You, we can drop the CVP very quickly uh, with this. The pumps, because of the uh, nature of the, uh, the flow and uh, HQ curves of the HeartMate 3 actually seem to balance flow very nicely. Um, and then the biggest thing you have to remember is to place a breast implant in the pericardial space to maintain your the, the size of the pericardium in an effort to if you're planning on transplanting the patient in the future. Um, there has been very good experience with this as well. Uh, this is, um, uh, I think, uh, Jan Schmido and his group put together the world experience and we contributed patients to this as well uh, with the HeartMate 3 uh, as a BIVAD. Uh, and you know, survival has been very good um, with, with this device. Um, obviously not a clinical trial, this is all retrospective. So it's difficult to compare all these different numbers uh, at survival curves, but uh, it's promising and it's an option available. Um, so just to summarize, uh, RV dysfunction is common with patients, especially those with chronic heart failure or getting VADs. Um, it's difficult but important to try to predict uh, who may not, uh, you know, not do well with RV failure. And I think pre-optimization of these patients. And, you know, Ash mentioned something when he was talking about heart transplant, you know, putting an axillary balloon pump or an axillary impella to get somebody ready for a heart transplant or a VAD is a, is a lot of effort and a lot of cost. 
And it requires more than just putting in the pump. The physiologic recovery of these patients also includes a prehabilitation component to it, you know, getting them up, moving, and uh, getting them active. And finally, um, you know, modern total artificial devices may improve survival for patients with biventricular failure. It may make sense instead of using a heart on somebody who's super ill to just move them over to a total artificial heart uh, scenario. That way you haven't wasted a scarce resource uh, and you provide them an opportunity to really get back to the bridge to transplant that we had envisioned in the early days of VAD. And I think I'm over time, so I'm going to end right there. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Donishman. That's a um, kind of a quick overview of something that could be its own whole hour. Um, so I, in uh, in a similar fashion, I want to ask like six questions in one. Um, I'll try and package it in a in a in a reasonable way. Um, you know, your last slide. Uh, I think that's a question that all of us have: is um, how what really is your strategy for conditioning? these patients um, and conditioning their RV, um, you know, when, what are your clinical predictors on when this patient is actually going to have to require BIVAD support? Um, and has the new allocation system to, to kind of um, touch on Dr. Shaw's talk influenced how you condition the RV? Um, if you think that it might uplist this candidate, if they might ultimately be a, a heart transplant candidate, and then if they do end up going the durable route, how do you really choose between a heart made six and a total artificial heart? I know right now there's only one, but um, feel free to answer any or all. Or <laughs> Each of those can be, I think, a, you know, uh, their own webinar. But, you know, I think that what we do here is that the first step is we, you know, if patients are escalating inotropes and are unstable, have, you know, secondary signs of, of organ dysfunction. So, really the, truly the Intermax one or you know, very high Intermax two patients, uh, what we'll do is we'll, as a first step, we'll take them to the operating room and put in an axillary impella 5.5. And the goal there, especially if we're trying to determine if they're gonna be able to wait for a heart transplant or if they're going to uh, needing a durable LVAD is we wanna see physiologic improvement and we wanna see how their right ventricle accommodates to having you know, four and a half liters, five liters of flow coming out of it. Um, the, the signs that I like to see that are positive that would tell me that the patient could tolerate a durable LVAD is decreasing inotrope requirement um, once you put the impella in, improved uh, end organ function uh, uh, are the two major things. And if we start seeing that, then the next step is, um, you know, making sure that they are physically fit for surgery. So, we have a, you know, we have a, a physical therapy regimen where the patients are ultimately brought to the point where they're ambulating multiple laps a day to make sure that they're nutritionally replete before we go down either pathway of transplant or VAD. Now, if we can't seem to get off the inotropes, if we can't seem to um, decrease at least the inotropes, or we can't turn around their end organ dysfunction, then we ask the question, you know, does this patient need biventricular support? If they do, and they are a transplant candidate, our preferred method is to proceed with percutaneous biventricular support. So using a Protect Duo to provide them some RV support. And again, we ask the question, are we getting off inotropes? Are they physiologically getting better? Um, to figure out if we have time to proceed with, uh, with transplant. Most of those patients you know, will now be status one and will get transplanted within a week or 10 days um, and, and do well. Um, they'll be more difficult than a, you know, somebody who's just hanging out with an axillary impella unstable or a status three patient who's just on inotropes. Uh, but uh, for the most part, we've been able to bring most of those patients through without a problem. Um, if they're not a transplant candidate, then we have to ask the question, then we ask the question of, should we proceed with biventricular mechanical support or do they really need to be um, somebody who, who is, who gets a shot at univentricular mechanical support. And then if they fail that, then they get transitioned to hospice. I think if you're gonna do durable biventricular support, it's best to make that decision a priori and just proceed with that. I think it's a setup for failure. Uh, you know, this is something that 
um, Dr. Copeland talked about all the time, you know, it, it, it's really a setup for failure to take the crash and burn patient and do a total artificial heart in them. And, you know, the current um, uh, uh, CARMAT study is designed in a way to prevent you from doing that. I think that makes sense. You know, um, if you have a crash and burn patient and you want to try a Hail Mary thing, then right now, today, it's durable LVAD plus temporary RVAD and hope that you can get them out and they'd be one of the 40% that survive. Well, with that, I want to open it up um, to the whole panel now. I know we've kind of run over, but it's been such an interesting uh, webinar. We don't want to cut short any of the great discussion. Um, I'll ask Dr. CJ uh, if he has any questions from the audience that they would like put to the panel. I know we're kind of running short on time, but we've had some great questions. Yeah, um, the most common questions that I'm getting are like the techniques about head fat exchange and uh, how do you tackle severe tricuspid regurgitation during an LVAD? Um, among these most common things that we are seeing here. Well, just quickly about tricuspid um, uh, regurgitation. I think the jury is still out on there. There's as many papers that say you should replace or repair, sorry, repair the tricuspid valve as there are that you shouldn't. We tried to do a CTS net trial around that. That was unfortunately never funded, but you know, I personally, don't re repair the tricuspid valve. I'd be interested, you know, Amy, Ash, Mark, what do you guys do? Leave it alone. I don't touch it either. Unless I will say that, I, unless they've got a lot of devices, you know, if they've got TR because, you know, that AICD lead is sitting in there, I get it. Um, but I think this notion that somehow the RV functions better early and that I'm not, not buying it. And uh, I think the less you mess, I mean, what, the one durable thing about LVAD outcomes is that the longer you're on bypass, the worse your outcomes are. In a multivariate, you mean, take all the other factors out of it. So I think the, you know, the more efficient we are, less bleeding, that wins the day, I think, in LVAD world. I think one last also question. To, to Adam's poll question about how LVADs are being implanted across centers also begs the question about right the right ventricle and how we can protect it. You know, the bithoracotomy approach um, has been shown to be protective to the RV, which kind of goes along with you don't need to mess around with the tricuspid and all this other stuff if the way that you're putting the pump in, if it's, you know, geometry or if it's the not messing around with opening so much of the pericardium for whatever reason that the right heart does better with some of these minimally invasive approaches i think that also lends itself to just not messing around with the tricuspid and seeing how you go i also think you know well just one item that's just an area for discovery is i think we still understand why these rvs fail when we put these LVADs in yeah like the RV, I know, I know we talk about the septum moving. That's, you know, kind of ancient um, data on that, honestly. I mean, isn't it a mystery? Like you look at this RV, it's, it's pumping, it looks great. The minute you stick them, stick the LVAD in, it just looks terrible. And I, and I remain puzzled by this. And I'm, I'm convinced that tells me that there's something else going on that's more than just pericardial restraint and um, some of these other things. My you, my my you, thought is that it's actually coronary <laughs> perfusion. So there, that's we're, that's something we're investigating. But I throw it out there for other very smart people to kind of sort this because we don't know what happens to the right coronary perfusion during LVAD support in these models because it's hard to measure. You guys, yeah. you, does the panelists rely on any uh, protect duo support for these failing RVs after the LVAD implantation? You know, because uh, Monty had briefly touched on that uh, that can be part of his conditioning strategy. So, but what about the after effects? <laughs> yeah, and what about the? After? I mean, you know, we, we've we've started using it a little bit more. You know, there is a learning curve to it, getting it set up so that you try to minimize your pulmonary pulmonic valve insufficiency. You know, what, what I realize what I've realized is that you kind of actually you have to put it in as far as you can and then pull it back to kind of center it in the valve. Um, to try to minimize your pulmonic insufficiency and recirculation that happens because of that. Um, I think um, ultimately still Impella RP, Protec Duo, or any homemade version thereof will not drop your CVP as well as a surgical RVAD. That's what I've seen. And I don't know if 
Amy and Ash have had different experiences with that. Um, it, uh, you know, we have been able to limp many patients through, with, you know, once th that have developed worsening RV failure over the course of their initial index um, LVAD implantation hospitalization. We've been able to limp them through with probably, a, you know, 60% or so success uh, with these devices. Um, you're better in the younger people. Um, but I think no matter what, if you're putting some kind of acute mechanical circulatory support, you're, you know, that, that there's going to be a negative uh, survival outcome there. All right, and another uh, small question is a patient with three mitral clips and a mitral stenosis needs an LVAD. How do you deal? Is a question from the audience to the panelists. Get to replace the valve. So is it, yeah. I'm sure that's going to change the strategy of uh, many, many invasive or thyroid approaches for the end those things. I mean, you know, there, you can actually remove those mitral clips uh, without destroying the leaflets. You can unlock them. There's some steps to doing that. Um, they say you can do it easily. I've never been able to actually do it easily. I agree with Ash. I think it's just easier and faster to go in there and replace the valve. And, uh, Dr. Fiedler, we've gotten a couple questions about HVAD pump thrombosis um, and the panel um, strategies to managing it, thrombolytics, immediate pump exchange. What are kind of the thoughts of the, of the group? I like to try anticoagulation first and it usually doesn't work well and then you end up pump exchange. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now the question to Dr. Slaughter is like now the CARMED um, are they going to re-implant after in October 2022 is what we see online? Uh, so uh, uh, Duke uh, did the uh, first, uh, we did the next two. Uh, we actually did the first woman, which I think was important. And quite frankly, it fit uh, quite well. Uh, all patients uh, did well hemodynamically. Uh, uh, there are some... Uh, uh, concerns. Uh, it's a very uh, manufacturer. Uh, it's a very complicated device. And so they're working through a few issues uh, before we uh, continue implanting uh, more patients. Uh, but hemodynamically, as uh, excellent uh, outcomes. Uh, or a woman actually was um, an electric cart on oxygen and hadn't been able to walk in years. And when she went home, uh, she was ambu ambulating independently off oxygen and visit Walmart. Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting and appears to be potentially effective device. But I do think it'll be October towards the end of the year uh, before we restart. Okay, everyone. Well, I think with that, we are about um, 20 minutes over. Uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great talk. And um, so I will... Um, I'll just close by saying thank you to each of our panelists. This is a fascinating area uh, of developing technology, um, trying to meet a demand that far outstrips the supply. Um, and uh, this will be recorded um, for everyone, anyone that wants to go back um, and, um, and, and, and look at the polls and the discussion points. And um, thank you everyone again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks. Uh, great Thanks. webinar and wonderful Thanks. questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.